In this part of the lecture, we'll start with an overview of the heartbeat, then talk about what we need to have happen during the heartbeat in terms of conduction, go over some important autorhythmic nodes and fibers, talk about the pattern of conduction that we see during the cardiac cycle, and then talk about which areas have the most rapid, have different rhythms and why it matters that the SA node is the fastest. Our goal right now is to understand how the heartbeat is organized in order to accomplish the goals we want. So let's think about what we want the heart to do. The end goal is to have the heart push blood out through these arteries from the left ventricle out to the rest of the body through the systemic circulation and from the right ventricle to the lungs. But the end goal is to have the heart push the blood out. We've got these upper chambers receiving blood, so we want them to push their blood into the ventricles to make sure the ventricles have as much blood as possible when they're ready to contract, and then to have the ventricles contract forcefully to push that blood out. So we kind of have multiple goals here. We want the atria to contract first to top off the ventricles, and we want that contraction kind of go downward because that's the direction where the blood has to go. Then after that we want the ventricles to contract and their contraction should really be sort of upward to push the blood out through that exit that goes out the top of the heart. So really we have several questions we need to answer. We want to know how do we get this contraction to reliably begin in the atria? How do we get it to go top down from there? And then how do we get it to then move to the ventricles, but only after the atria are done, and have the ventricles contract upward? And how, do we want to, how can we make sure all of that happens in the right order? So those are our major questions we're going to have to answer right now. We know that autorhythmic tissue is going to play a big role in organizing and starting the contraction of the heart. So there's really three areas of autorhythmic tissue we're going to pay a lot of attention to, and I'll tell you in a moment where they are in the heart and how they work. But first I'll list them up here. So one is going to be the sinoatrial node, also known as the SA node. Another one is going to be the atrioventricular node, also known as the AV node. And finally, the Purkinje fibers. All of these are clusters and groups of autorhythmic tissue. So all of these are going to have a role to play in directing areas of the heart. There's also going to be some other areas that are going to be involved in taking signals from one area to the next. So let's think about how we're going to answer our questions. First, how are we going to make sure that our whole process starts in the atria and generally directs the atria to contract kind of in a top-down direction? If we want that to happen, it would make sense that our first set of autorhythmic tissue would be somewhere higher up in the atria. And in fact, this initial area, the sinoatrial node, is up here in the upper part of the right atrium, pretty close to where the superior and inferior vena cavae, vena cavae join up to it. That sinoatrial node, this first part, has on its own, it'll contract about once every two-thirds of a second. So its native rate is about 90 beats per minute. On its own, it'll generate action potentials about 90 times a minute, which is about once every two-thirds of a second. The autorhythmic cells of that SA node are linked up to the muscle in the atrial wall. So when the action potential begins in the cells of the SA node, it passes through gap junctions into the cardiac muscle, the contractile cells, which then pass it from cell to cell out over the atria. I'll use orange to indicate the spread of those action potentials through the contractile cells. Now, one problem with this drawing is you can't see that the atrial muscle goes across from one atrium to the other. It's not actually blocked by these vessels. They kind of go up through the middle. So I'm just going to draw it passing through like this. And you can see that overall the direction is sort of this direction and kind of downward, which is going to help our atria contract in a downward-ish wave of contraction. Now, 
at first glance, it looks like that ought to be enough. I mean, we've got our action potential traveling through the muscle. It's going to hit the atria first and then the ventricles. But there are some problems with that. First of all, if this passes through the atria and then into the ventricles, the action potential ha moves very quickly. It propagates across the heart very, very fast, much faster than the muscle twitch. So if that was what happened, we'd start the action potential here, it would go through the heart, and following behind it would be the beginning of the twitch. But the atria would start twitching and then the ventricles would begin twitching before the atria had really finished or even gotten very far into their twitch. Now, keep in mind here, the atria don't have to push blood very far. They just have to push blood to the ventricles. The ventricles have to push their blood throughout the body, especially the left ventricle, which has to cover everything in the body. So you can imagine that the ventricles are much stronger than the atria. The atria don't have to be very strong, but the ventricles do. So if our atria contract and are pushing blood down, and then the, before they're even done, the ventricles start, and they start pushing their blood this way, think about which way blood's going to flow through these valves. It'll begin going down, and then as soon as the ventricles begin their contraction, that blood will start to flow back and those valves will close. The atria won't really have a chance to do much of anything. So that wouldn't, we, we need this to do is wait a little longer. We need this to have the atria contract and then wait until they're just about done with their contraction before the ventricles start their contraction. If this just passed straight from atria to ventricles, that wouldn't work. So instead, the base of the heart this layer of the heart where all of the valve flaps are anchored has a thick layer of connective tissue. And that connective tissue doesn't actually allow the muscle from the atria to connect to the ventricles. Our action potential will not pass through that base. So we, the action potential spreads quickly through the atria but doesn't go directly into the ventricles. But that'll get our atria started on their twitch. Now we do want the ventricles to contract, so we can't just stop there. If the atria contracted without the ventricles, the heart would be useless. So we do want the ventricles to contract, but we want them to wait and we want their contraction to be sort of bottom up. That's going to be a little tricky. Let's see how we're going to do that. Well, as it turns out, there is another bunch of, auto, of autorhythmic tissue down near the base, the bottom of the right atrium, close to the middle. This next, this next little bit of autorhythmic tissue is the atrioventricular, or AV node. Its native rate is more like 50 or 60 beats per minute. It's a little slower on its own. And the SA node is connected to it directly with what we call internodal fibers. So these connect to the SA node. What that does for us is make sure that as soon as the SA node starts its action potential, and that action potential is starting to spread through the atrial muscle, it very quickly moves down to the AV node and brings the AV node up to threshold and starts its action potential instantly so that the AV node knows that the SA node has started the heartbeat even before the atria are done. Now, our AV node has a sort of a tail. That tail punches through the base of the heart here. That tail is called the bundle of hiss. Hope everyone can read that. The bundle of hiss. That bundle of hiss is really a part of the AV node. The, SA, the AV node and the bundle of hiss have this interesting way of delaying the action potential. It spreads very, very quickly down these fibers then hits the AV node, brings them up, brings the cells there up to threshold. They start their action potential. 
But the action potential works its way through the AV node and the bundle of hiss very slowly. So in a way, this holds and delays the action potential, letting it only move through very slowly while the atria are in their contraction. So this is delaying the signal while the atria finish their twitch. Now, about the time that the atria get done with their twitch, the action potential that's been propagating its way through the AV node and the bundle of Hiss gets down to the end and enters a pair of structures we're going to call the bundle branches. One heading down in the wall of the, the middle part, the septum of the right ventricle, and another heading down in the septum, but on the left ventricle side. So these are the left and right bundle branches. Kind of like internodal fibers. They aren't exactly autorhythmic on their own, at least not last I checked, but they carry the signal quickly down here to the bottom, which is confusingly called the apex of the heart. Down here at the apex of the heart, the bundle branches turn upward in structures that we call the Purkinje fibers. So the Purkinje fibers here are going to be in green. The Purkinje fibers are also autorhythmic. They have an even slower rate on their own. It's around 40 beats per minute. maybe even a little slower. These Purkinje fibers carry the signal upward from the apex up into the ventricular muscle. And from, the, from them, it spreads into these ventricular contractile cells. Here's a somewhat more accurate anatomical image that I found online. Uh, this image doesn't specifically label the Purkinje fibers, but you can see them there coming up through the walls of the ventricles. This image does have the moderator band, which we did not talk about and you are not responsible for. It also shows at the top of the atria a, bu a bundle carry that carries the signal directly to the left atrium. We didn't talk about that specifically and you don't need to know about it, but still this gives you an idea of how it looks in an actual heart. And that's what's going to cause the ventricles to contract. So to summarize what's going on here briefly, the general pattern of a heartbeat works like this. On its own, the SA node starts, starts an action potential. That action potential starts to spread through the atrial muscle, but before it's even gotten very far, it's already moved very quickly down these internodal fibers and triggered the AV node to start its action potential. But while this action potential is spreading through the atrial muscle, causing the atria to twitch, it's already in the AV node, but moving very slowly through the AV node and bundle of Hiss. So we have two things going on. The atria are in their twitch while this signal is working its way through. So our atria are squeezing. At about the time they get done with their squeeze and start to relax, the action potential moves quickly down through the bundle branches, up into the Purkinje fibers, and out into the ventricular muscle, which then starts its twitch. So if I look at the spread of action potential, we go here and then flash down to here while we're spreading through here, working its way slowly through and then quickly up through there into the ventricles. If I look at the twitch, we go start here, atria are now twitching, and about the time they get done, the signal gets down to the ventricles, and as they start to relax, the ventricles do their twitch, squeezing the blood that just got pushed into them up and out of the heart. So that accomplished a lot of our goals. We got our atria to contract first, top down. Ventricles would wait, signal's already here, but working its way through slowly until the atria are done. And when they start to relax, we bring the signal to the apex and then cause the ventricles to contract from the bottom up. So everything's happening in the right direction and one after the other with the right delay. Which leaves us with one more question. How do we make sure this is coordinated? Because
If the AV node is also autorhythmic tissue, so it's capable of generating its own action potentials, what's to stop it from going off independently and causing the ventricles to contract out of sync with the atria? That's where those ideas of native rate are gonna come in. So let's do this here. Our SA node has a native rate of about 90 beats per minute. Oops, beats per minute, which is about the same as saying that it will go off about 600 milliseconds after the last action potential. So after it has an action potential, it'll start its next one after about 600 milliseconds. The AV node has a native rate closer to about 50 or 60 beats per minute. Let's say that means it's going to be about, about 1,200 milliseconds after the last action potential. And our Purkinje fibers have a native rate of about I think I said in the last one 40, it's more like 30 beats per minute. So that means they'll wait about 2400 milliseconds after the last action potential. This is actually going to help us keep all of this together. And it's a little bit weird to think about. So let's start with, let's start with this. Let's imagine that you have two friends, and each of you is blinking your eyes. You are going to blink about once every two-thirds of a second. So your blinking is going blink, 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 about that fast. Now your friend, let's say Balthamos, will be your friend's name. Balthamos blinks about every second or a little more. So his normal blinking rate would be blink, blink, blink blink, blink, about that fast. But he will also blink as soon as you do. So if you're going blink, 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 and he would normally go blink, blink. If he has to go and you do, it'll be blink, 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 blink. He'll be driven by you because you're faster. Then if your friend Cerulean blinks very slowly normally, blink, 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 but also will follow along when Balthamos blinks, and Balthamos is following you. Now what we have is blink, blink, blink. All three of you blinking according to your fastest rate. Here's another way of looking at that. Let's erase this. And now we'll draw up three graphs, one for each of these areas, showing how they work. So this one will be for the SA node. This will be for the AV node. And this will be for the Purkinje fibers. Let's put a time scale on here. So here's 0, 1 second, 2 seconds, 3 seconds, 4 seconds. So I'm going to show how all three of these nodes would fire on their own, and then how, that, how the fact that they're linked together forces them to sync up. Now, if you're taking notes on this, I recommend don't take notes for a moment, wait till I'm done with this explanation, and then kind of go back and figure out how to take your notes. So if the SA node has a normal rate of about firing every 600 milliseconds or so, assuming it just started with one at time zero, you'd have another one at about 600 milliseconds, about 1,200, about 1,800, 2,400, 3,000, 3,600, and so on. That's, what's its action. That's what the action potentials from the SA node would look like. The AV node, if it's going about every 1,200 milliseconds, would look something like this. 1,200, 24, 36, and so on.
and the Purkinje fibers if they're every 2400 seconds would look more like this. Now, keep in mind though, that the SA node is linked directly to the AV node. First, let's look at these two, which means that when the SA node fires off, that action potential very quickly gets to the AV node, which will bring it up to threshold immediately and trigger its action potential. So our, S our action potential at the SA node triggers an action potential at the AV node, so those two are in sync. Now the AV node is now in the middle of depolarizing, but the SA node fires off another signal at 600 milliseconds, which gets to the AV node, brings it up to threshold, and forces it to have an action potential right there. Now on its own, it would now wait 1200 milliseconds before having another one. So if that was at 1600, the next one would be at 1800. But the SA node fires again at 1200 milliseconds, which forces it up to threshold and triggers another action potential at 1200 milliseconds. And then again at 1800. Each time the AV node would normally wait 1200 milliseconds before its next action potential. But since the SA node keeps driving it, it's forced to reset itself over and over again every time the SA node does. That way, the SA node forces the AV node to follow its pattern. And likewise, since the Purkinje fibers are getting their signals from the AV node, they're also going to be forced to follow the same more rapid pattern. Rather than have, taking their sweet time, they're going to have to follow the rapid signals from the SA node. You get the idea. So that's how the SA node keeps all this together. By being the one that goes off the most often, it drives the other two areas, forcing everything in the heart to follow that rhythm. In a way, the SA node overrides the other nodes. Which leaves us with one more question. If the SA node is the one driving, why, does the, why do we need the AV node and the Purkinje fibers to be autorhythmic at all? Why can't they just pass the signal along? Why do we need them to be able to generate action potentials? That, that's another interesting question. Let's take a look. So let's imagine that this is what's happening, but then let's imagine that the SA node fails and stops sending signals here. So I'll take these away. So if my SA node has stopped sending its signals at this point, If the AV and Purkinje fibers weren't autorhythmic, they wouldn't do anything either. The heart would stop beating and we would die. But instead, my AV node, which is sitting here waiting for a signal from the SA node, when it doesn't see one, it's just going to wait the 1200 milliseconds it would normally wait. So this was at 1600. So by the time we get to 1800, there it goes. Because it's autorhythmic tissue just on a slower time scale. And then it'll read and wait another little while. You get the idea. Now, the Purkinje fibers, since they're connected to the AV node, are now going to be following the slower rhythm of the AV node. So even though my SA node failed and is no longer sending signals, the AV node will take over at a slightly slower rate and continue the ventricles work, which means the heart is still going to be pushing blood out through the arteries. It's true that we're not getting the boost from the atria, but as you'll learn about in the next lecture, that the atrial blood is not actually, strictly speaking, necessary. The ventricles will get about three quarters of their blood without the atria helping them at all. We'll talk about that when we talk about the cardiac cycle. So because the AV node and Purkinje fibers are also autorhythmic, they can cause the heart, the ventricles at least, to continue to beat even if the SA node fails. It's sort of like a little backup system. One final question that sometimes comes up is, if the autonomic nervous system adjusts the speed of the AV node, 
What would happen if it slowed it down enough that it was slower than the AV node? If the autonomic nervous system made the SA node, say, go down to a very slow native rate of something like 30 or 40, which would be very unusual, but maybe not impossible, would the AV node then be faster and take over? The answer is no, because the autonomic nervous system also controls the AV node. So when it speeds up the SA node, it also speeds up the AV node some. The SA node will still be faster, but they'll stay sort of in sync. All right, that about covers that. In our next final lecture, we're going to be talking about how this pattern of cardiac conduction leads to the ECG, the electrocardiogram, which you've undoubtedly seen and heard of, how the cardiac cycle is constructed, how we talk about the pressure changes in different areas of the heart, how that makes blood flow through the different valves, all of that leading up to something we call the Wiggers diagram which is a way of bringing together the idea of the electrical signals of the heart, pressures and flow, valves opening and closing, and how much blood is where in the heart. The Wiggers diagram is tricky, but we'll go through practicing how to make it. You'll practice that a lot on your own. And by the time you're done with that, you'll have a pretty good sense of how the heart works. All right, see you next time.